for session A, we are going to start with a keynote speaker, uh, Dylan uh, William. And uh, Dylan William, you certainly all know about him, but he received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, in 1986. He joined the electromagnetics uh, fields division of the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 1989, where he developed electrical waveform and microwave metrology. He has published over 100 technical papers. He's a fellow of the Atropoli. He's the recipient of the Atropoli Maurice Leeds Award and the Atropoli Joseph Kisley Award. He served as editor of the Atropoli Transactions on Microwave Theory and Techniques and as 2017 president of the Atropoli Microwave Theory and Techniques Society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about millimeter wave LSNAs. I, I think uh, a lot of people are very interested in trying to develop something like that. Uh, there, we're not the only ones who have been working towards this, and I have some um, sort of intermediate results that I'd like to show you, but, but they look quite promising for the approach that, that uh, we're, we're taking. Oops. So, you all know what the LSNA is all about. You take a vector network analyzer, and it has couplers and receivers in it, either temporal or, or frequency domain receivers, uh, either one. And you calibrate it with a um, calibration kit. And then you calibrate it with a power meter so that you add power to your S parameter calibration. And then you calibrate it with a phase reference. And what this allows you to do is instead of measuring just ratios of, of um, forward and backward waves and forming S parameters, you can then measure directly the amplitude and phase of the forward and backward waves. And that's a really, really big um, advance. And in particular, uh, you can take the A's and B's, which are those forward and backward wave amplitudes, and transform them into voltages and currents. And then you can take a uh, Fourier transform. And you can actually look at those voltages and currents in time. So you have not only a frequency domain representation, but a time domain representation. And this is the collector current on a transistor as a function of time that we measured in our lab. And this is a really very neat uh, thing to be able to do especially because this corresponds to exactly what you see in, on your, um, computer -aided, in your computer aided design software. So that, that makes this uh, extremely useful. There, yeah, okay. So the, I would characterize the LSNA as an instrument for all seasons. You can, you can do a tremendous amount with this approach. Uh, as you can see in this uh, diagram here, the basic idea is that you have couplers here next to your DUT. This allows the vector network analyzer to monitor the forward and backward waves after it's calibrated. You can add tuners here, and that doesn't uh, really change things very much. It just relieves us of working in a 50 ohm system. So you can work in any impedance system. And that lets you measure voltages and currents, compare them to your simulations uh, in time. You can, you can um, measure trajectories in, in space, in the IV space. And most of these are also really geared towards measuring on wafer because that's certainly where the most important modeling now is happening at high frequencies. And in the millimeter wave transceivers that people are thinking about, they're really thinking of eliminating the coaxial reference plane. In fact, they already have eliminated the coaxial reference plane. They're not planning on building any handsets with coaxial or rectangular waveguide connectors at all. Everything is going to be either tested on wafer or directly over the airs. Oops, sorry. So there is one big limitation. 
I am confused about what's going on. Here, here we go. So, so there is one big limitation here, and that's frequency. If you want to characterize a device at millimeter waves, so say you're at 80, you want to characterize something at 80 gigahertz, you, you need to capture the harmonics at 160 and maybe even um, uh, 240 gigahertz in order to do a nonlinear device characterization. So this is obviously uh, a very challenging problem. So um, while we have lots and lots of applications, such as device and amplifier modeling that do need this frequency performance. Of course, there are other ones like modulated signal and waveform measurement. But um, this is the problem that I was going to talk about here today, was how do you uh, increase the frequency range of the LSNA? So just at this conference, and Ritsu has been talking about a 220 gigahertz vector network analyzer that they've developed with a new type of connector. Uh, in, in the past, these connectors have been really problematic, and it's, I would say, a little bit unclear exactly how high in frequency you can go with these connectors. But um, I think that's a, a really big advance towards doing this at much higher frequencies. Uh, Jan Verspecht and the University of Limoges have worked on wave probes like this. These are really very interesting uh, probes. So. They have a, a little loop with two pieces of coax, so they sort of have a differential kind of architecture. And if this is placed over a transmission line, the common mode generates a voltage on this loop here. So you measure that in the common mode. And then the current, the magnetic uh, flux lines, have to pass through the loop. And they create a differential signal. And so that lets you um, immediately differentiate between forward and backward modes. Essentially, you're measuring, uh, getting a measurement of the voltage and current or something proportional to the voltage and current directly. At PTB and NPL, uh, they really started electro-optic sampling there before we started that in a serious way at, at, at NIST. Uh, they've built uh, very, very um, fast systems that are capable of measuring uh, forward and backward waves. And essentially, uh, the way that they do that is they develop a system that can measure the voltage with an electro-optic approach. So it's based on Pockel's effect. Uh, so the probe actually responds to the voltage, but then they do what our our forebearers did when they used a slotted line, and they moved that measurement uh, system uh, along the, the uh, transmission line, measure the standing wave ratio, and then that lets them differentiate between forward and backward waves. And they've done this to very, very high frequencies. At NIST, we had sort of a, a, a different idea a little bit. We were worried in particular about the interaction of this piece of electromagnetic material that they were suspending over the transmission line as they were measuring, trying to measure these um, very fast signals in the transmission line. So at, at NIST, we did things a little bit differently. Uh, at, at NIST, we actually made our measurements directly on the substrate here in a non-invasive way. So we chose a substrate that was actually electro-optic and whose and the way in which the substrate um, uh, reacts to the electric field is to change the speed of propagation of, of uh, uh, light as it, as it propagates through the crystal. And we set things up with the axes in such a way that it would um, change the polarization as you change the speed of two different um, uh, uh, polarized beams going, going through the uh, substrate. And this was very nice. This let us really focus on doing the mismatch corrections correctly without having to worry about how the probe itself was changing the situation as, a, as you were making the measurements um, on, the, on the wafer. And we were able to make measurements. This is an example here of a measurement that we were able to make with a 200 gigahertz bandwidth. And um, 
we were able to get uh, mismatch corrected measurements with uncertainty and that's, uh, that's shown right here. These little dashed lines are, are uncertainties. Of course, there's always sort of a friendly competition between uh, NMIs. Um, so uh, PTB and NPL, they started to, and this, I think most of this work was, I guess, done at um, PTB. They set up a system where they could look at the signals that were being measured um, with the probe on top of the wafer, and then they simultaneously um, uh, developed the system so that they could measure the way that we were measuring things at NIST. They could measure from behind, and they could actually either have this, this um, uh, probe on top, or they could remove it, and they could measure the signal in the same way that we were doing it non-invasively. These were very, very interesting experiments here. Uh, this is uh, measurements as a function of the distance between this um, uh, suspended electro-optic uh, element on top of the of the uh, transmission line. Uh, so here you see, at if you just lay this down on the transmission line, you get, you get this behavior here. This is what you get when you make the measurement with the um, uh, external this this um, this uh, suspended uh, electro-optic substrate completely removed. From, from the measurement. So you can really see that this is an important uh, effect. And since then, PTB has been doing measurements both ways. And I'm not sure about NPL, but uh, I think PTB has actually sort of switched over to this non-invasive approach. And NPL and PTB have done a very good job of actually comparing their measurements and showing that they get something that's quite similar to each other. Okay, and it's not just the NMIs who are interested in this. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Zoya Popovich and John Whitaker have worked on different systems. Uh, they've worked at using electro-optic sampling to look across a, 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 an aperture, um, try to understand an, antennas, and they've built um, photoconductive probes here where they can look and try to, to probe right on substrates. And I put together a little comparison of the approaches. And um, you can see here the kinds of things that you would like to have. You'd like to be able to make measurements on any substrate. You would like your measurements to be non-invasive. You would like not to have connectors if you, if, if you can. Uh, that certainly raises your frequency limits. You'd like built-in load pull. Uh, you'd like things to be self-calibrating if you, if you can, um, so you don't have to have calibration standards. Um, on, your, on your substrate, or at least minimal calibration standards. And uh, you'd like high frequency. So I put together this chart, and um, here we have the high frequency VNA with standard probes, for example, going up to 220 gigahertz. The wave probes that I told you about, uh, I believe those have been tested at least to 18 gigahertz, and Jan's in the room, so he can tell me if, if that's not right. PTB and NPL have have done electro-optic sampling at a terahertz. Uh, at NIST, we've done that to 200 gigahertz. Uh, photoconductive probes have gone up to about 8 gigahertz, I believe, was, was uh, what they achieved. And I'm going to tell you about something that we're trying to do at, at NIST. It's an alternative approach. And um, you notice that I arranged the table in these categories so that um, in our approach, at least that I'm going to tell you about, we get all yeses here. So that was very uh, tricky, sneaky of us to do that. So what, what does this, uh, so these are the people who are in, involved in, in this project, uh, Rich Chamberlain, Jerome Charon, and Tashi Dennis at, at NIST. And uh, they're trying to develop, um, it's not exactly a single chip LSNA, but it's close. So this is, this is what the LSNA looks like. Uh, let's start on this end here. There's a low-pass filter that passes uh, energy from 60 to 90 gigahertz. And that goes into a filter manifold here. And then we have two 
frequency doublers here so that we can put in uh, signals, again, in the same uh, lower frequency sort of uh, millimeter wave band and uh, multiply up the signals here to um, the 120 to 180 gigahertz band and also the 180 to 270 gigahertz band. And then these are combined in the filter manifold. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. We can control three harmonics um, at, at this point here. Then we have an electro-optic sampling section here that is uh, non-invasive, uh, built onto the same substrate. And then here we have contact pads where we can attach this chip to a wafer probe. So I'll show you how that works in a second. Uh, first, I'd just like to go through some of our experience in actually building this. So uh, there were a lot of components here. This is just a resistor with a um, bias network and uh, um, capacitors, and isolation capacitors, and so forth. So we made measurements of all of these uh, structures. I think one of the things that we noticed uniformly was that we tended to get better performance, uh, and our, our measured performance was usually better than our own simulations. So that was uh, interesting. Uh, this is the filter manifold. We were looking to make sure that the filter manifold was working as we had intended it to work. We characterized the transistors ourselves and compared this to the models from the manufacturer. And you can see how these uh, compare. It's really quite nice. And these are the rat race couplers that we used in, in the frequency doublers. And uh, you can see that uh, this was sort of, uh, this was actually a passive test of, of, of just these uh, rat race couplers with input and output, but you can see that things looked really, really good. I can't show you the actual uh, results that we had for testing these, these doublers. They did work as we expected, but the setup was very complicated. We, had, we could only make measurements at one frequency or two frequencies in the band, so um, there was no graphs to show you here on, on that. And then this is the electro-optic sampling section. So this is essentially a coplanar waveguide, a little piece of coplanar waveguide. And this is a photo of that being uh, tested here. So you have a center conductor, uh, two outer conductors, and a slot. And we actually got um, better measured transmission here than our simulated transmission. So we we're very pleased about that. And you can see that the uh, phase, of course, agreed pretty well. And essentially what we planned to do was exactly what um, uh, we have been doing, PTB, NPL, and NIST uh, previously, and that was to use a sort of slotted line approach so that we can use this section to measure not only amplitude and phase, but also by moving the beam to measure and, and differentiate between the forward and backward waves. Okay, so this is what the chip looks like in sum, and we use all of this, these sections to control the signals, this section to measure the signals, and we can actually do a full calibration here at a reference plane um, in, in this, um, in this uh, piece of coplanar waveguide because we can measure both forward and backward waves, amplitude and phase, so we get everything at that reference plane. And then here we attach the probe, and then the idea is that when this probe gets connected to an integrated circuit, you have an on-wafer calibration kit on that integrated circuit. You can do an S-parameter calibration there on the circuit. You have an S-parameter calibration here, and then you can just transfer your reference planes along with the power and phase calibrations that we um, were able to construct uh, in this coplanar waveguide using the electro-optic sampling. Um, so this is the, what the housing looks like for all of this. We did try two kinds of probes uh, here. We've been working with both GGB and, and Dominion on this. And so uh, we have slightly different fixtures for each type of probe. 
you have uh, signals here coming up in, in small coax uh, transmission lines from, um, from the outside. Uh, these are at, um, at the uh, millimeter wave frequencies, and then the ones that you need to multiply up are coming in here, and those, those get multiplied up. The, this is where the chip sits. So these are these coaxial um, uh, uh, lines coming up here. The chip is actually mounted on this high K epoxy, so it has a high dielectric constant. This removes surface waves pretty effectively out of the chip. And then there's a hole here for the laser to come in to the back side of the chip and actually make measurements in this coplanar waveguide. Uh, this is what it looks like assembling this. So you can see everything was assembled under microscopes and actually with probe stations. Very convenient to move things around. And here's the chip. You can actually see how it's been um, mounted here and the connections made. Here you see the low pass filter and the multipliers here. We haven't made these connections yet. And Ari Feldman and Kasi Smith were doing a lot of this uh, work. This is actually testing the chips. Uh, so the chip is mounted inside here. And this is just doing uh, tests to see how these things might work. And this is the uh, uh, close up making a contact to a calibration standard here. This was happened to be the Dominion probe here. First module we tested, we didn't work out as quite as well as we had hoped. Um, right here, uh, we, we did a scan actually over the, um, over the coplanar waveguide. So we have the ability to measure the uh, fields that we see not only on, this, on the center conductor, but in the gaps and then in the, in, the, uh, um, in the two ground planes. And what you could see here was that in this transverse direction, we really had a very non-uniform response. You can sort of see something here that looks about right. This is the, where the center conductor is. But um, when we went back and looked at the assembly, we saw that this actually wasn't done very well. So. Um, we, we weren't getting a good connection on, on one of the grounds, but uh, this was our very first uh, sort of look at things. Um, but we didn't get as nice a response as we would have liked. Uh, we've since, since uh, corrected this problem. Uh, these are very recent results. Um, uh, so here you see that, that now we have a, a uniform uh, looking response over the whole um, guide here. And uh, we did a lot of work to improve our sampling. And I've, I didn't really point this out before, but um, in this sort of friendly competition that we have between NMIs, uh, PTB developed a very nice uh, sampling approach. Uh, it was um, instead of using a stage and moving a stage and then changing, using that to change the delay and the electro-optic sampling systems, they developed an asynchronous approach in which they offset the frequency in which they were generating pulses and the frequency at which they were measuring these, these um, uh, in, in which the signal was arriving. And that lets them uh, get a very, very quick measurement. So we developed uh, something very much like the PTB asynchronous sampling system shown here, in which the clock of the laser is slightly offset from the clock here that's uh, generating these pulses. And this is our system, what it, what it looks like. And this dramatically increases the speed of the measurements. And it really is a question of going from a measurement that takes a day to a measurement that takes maybe 10 seconds, something like that. So it's a really big change. I'd just like to uh, now show you what the setup looks like a little bit here then. So this is that asynchronous sampling uh, uh, system right right here, and this is all of the optics that goes behind. This is the um, uh, substrate here, and it's a little bit hard to see, but the probe is is and and the uh, chip are, are right under here. Okay, so I'd just like to uh, show you how this works. Um, what you see here is a measurement. 
Uh, this is a real-time measurement, except it just paused there for a moment. But anyway, this is a real-time measurement. As we move the electro-optic sampling point around on the integrated circuit, and what you see is that when we get to the maximum signal, we get a very nice clean waveform, and, but the waveform actually changes phase when we go from the center conductor out to the ground conductor of the, of the coplanar waveguide. So what this really shows you is that we are measuring, let me just go back a sec. Uh, what, what this really shows you is that we're measuring um, not just amplitude, but we're measuring amplitude and phase. And here there's only one sinusoid. This is an 80 gigahertz sinusoid. But we're, we can actually determine the phase at each point in the guide. And that's, that's really important for getting this to work. And then we can scan points and, and start to measure the, and differentiate between the forward and backward wave. So again, here you're going to see this change in phase here. Um, so you see the change in phase as we scan from the ground plane to the center conductor. And then we get this um, big, big signal on the center conductor. And again, really a real-time system, uh, which, which is very, very neat. This is a first proof of concept here. We put a um, uh, 80 gigahertz signal into a transistor and tried to look at the harmonics coming out. And here you can see at low, uh, at a low signal level that you get essentially a sine wave. And then as you start to increase the signal level, you really start to see this sine wave distorting. So we think that we're getting at least three harmonics and probably more uh, out of this. Uh, oops. And then this shows uh, the 80 gigahertz um, signal that we measured. Uh, again, scanned across the entire coplanar waveguide. And then we started looking at the 160 gigahertz signal that, that we measured. This is the same measurement, but we're able to, to independently see the 80 gigahertz signal and its amplitude and phase at each point, but also the 160 gigahertz signal and its amplitude and phase at each point. And so this is the 160 gigahertz signal here scanned across the coplanar waveguide. So we haven't actually taken this to the stage where we can do a calibration yet. I don't think we're that far away, but um, that's where we are um, today. There's another project at NIST that I thought you might be interested in. Um, people were in, sort of inspired by um, what we've been doing on this millimeter wave LSNA, and they've been working on a, a faster source for this because it's really source limited. And this source essentially combines many, many more sinusoids together than what we're able to do with our system. And it uses uh, electro-optics here to increase the number of sources, but keep them all synchronized and controllable. So um, that's a, a project, ongoing project at NIST that sort of complements this uh, millimeter wave LSNA. And uh, these are some of the graduate students, uh, some of the students who are working on that, on that project. And here you can see they're using a, a, a comb in which all of the tones are uh, synchronized with each other. This was an early measurement that they just got in the lab, a one terahertz uh, bandwidth. And then they have this control system, which they've been able to demonstrate uh, already. And now they're starting to work on this part, this part here. Well, I'd like to really thank uh, GGB and Dominion Microprobes for helping us out with um, uh, supplying the probes that we used for all of this. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan. It's a really exciting piece of work. So we have time for questions. Jan? First of all, I must, oh, is this turned on? Can you hear me? Yes, OK, good, sorry. I'm very, very impressed because the first LSNA we built 20 years ago was a whole rack. <laughs> now you scaled it down to a chip. 
If you keep going like this, we need an, uh, in 20 years an electron microscope just to see the LSNA, so that's really exciting. <laughs> now, my, my question actually is on, on the modeling of, the, of, your, of your waveguide structure, because you'll need the propagation constant and the uh, characteristic impedance, I, I assume, to sort everything out. Uh, do you envision a traceable way actually to characterize such a structure based on physical measurements and material characteristics? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, and we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, <clears throat> but I have to say that measuring the propagation constant is also extremely important because that's one of the few things that you can measure in a, in a very um, uh, rigorous way, I would say, about what you actually have on the wafer. So in the past, when we did measurements up to 220 gigahertz, we did do a comparison of using the electro-optic sampling system to measure that, um, that propagation constant in the transmission line in the coplanar waveguide. And uh, comparing that against direct measurements with a VNA. And what we found there was that we could get a better measurement of the uh, uh, propagation constant with the VNA than we could uh, measuring with the electro-optic sampling system. So we, are, we have built test structures along the way so that we can measure the propagation constant with the vector network analyzer and get our very best measurement of that and then um, use that and other things that we know about the transmission line to come up with the characteristic impedance and do the calibrations on the chip itself. And we found that that really improved the overall accuracy of the approach over using the electro-optic sampling system to try to measure that propagation constant. So that's a very, very good question. Thanks. Any other questions? I do have one. You mentioned that uh, you can use any substrate. Uh, is that the case? Or you, uh, any substrate can be used as electro uh, sampling? Uh, so, so that's not the case. Um, <laughs> okay, good. The electro optic sampling only you know has to be on an electro optic substrate. So, we used uh, these circuits were built on an indium uh, phosphide technology, which is electro optic. And so we could do the electro-optic sampling right next to the circuits that were um, controlling the harmonics and the, and the signals. Um, however, that gives us this full, while well, that gives us this full calibration on the electro-optic substrate, we do have a plan for transferring this to the integrated circuit that we want to test. And again, that's by fabricating an S-parameter calibration kit on that substrate. Um, and then doing a second tier calibration on that substrate and actually transferring the calibration from this circuit down through the probe to that circuit so that we will also get magnitude and phase. And this is just what everybody does now with the uh, connectorized um, uh, LSNAs right now to get, to get their, to move their reference plane down onto the IC. And I think that, you know, one of the very interesting things to see there is does this, how does this self-calibrating approach uh, really work out? And um, again, I think, I think what um, Enritsu has shown going up to 220 gigahertz is, is extremely important and, and very, very um, uh, heartening to see that happen. And it'll be really interesting to see exactly what, um, how these different kinds of approaches work. But I think that one of the things that I see is that we should have millimeter wave LSNAs one way or another in the next couple of years. Well, let's thank you. Oh, one more question. Do we have <laughs> time? Yeah, actually, we have time. Okay. I guess we have time, so. I'll try and make it very quick. Um, you only have one sampling point. Can you actually build the system so, say, for instance, you have um, digital sampling, so you have like eight points that don't need to move, and you can just then um, c compute out what the waveform is? And uh, there, there is somebody who started working on that, and the idea was to speed up the system so that you didn't, you know, you, you, we really do get all of the information we need by moving the sampling point that, that is actually working quite well now. Um, what they realized was that 
at least in the short term, it made a lot more sense to work on this asynchronous approach and really get that working. And that is working so fast now that we're not really too worried about, about the time involved. But um, initially, they did have plans for trying to measure a number of points simultaneously. And I think that could also be done to speed up the system. Thank you. Thank you. So let's thank uh, Dylan again. <laughs>